And uh, today we have the topic of urban forestry from a planning perspective. Uh, Johanna Lundström from a researcher in forest planning is going to be kind of our host and moderator. Um, then we have Karen Fellman Lundqvist, uh, who's the head of sustainability from School Skåpet, and Marcus Hedlum, professor in landscape management from SLU, that will be talking today. Um, and I wanted to first introduce the the future platforms. Um, the SLU Future Platforms promotes transdisciplinary research, education, and collaboration for a sustainable future. Um, and we improve collaboration between researchers and society. And specifically, I'm uh, the UMIO representative for Future Forests, and we are a platform for interdisciplinary research, forest research, collaboration, and research communication. And our program is unique among the future platforms in that we're actually a collaboration between SLU, UMIO University, and Skogforsk. Um, whereas the other ones are just SLU future platforms. And I believe Hannah wanted to introduce the, the Urban Futures program or not? Uh, or yes, enough? I can very quickly just uh, yes, yes. Uh, about SLU Urban Futures. I'm the communications officer for SLU Urban Futures and we work with uh, a lot of things. We don't drive any, any um, research projects as much as cells, but we want to offer forums for testing new ideas and uh, critical dialogues and experimental ways of working uh, with transdisciplinary focus. So um, we, the, we really enjoy also collaborating with uh, our other future platforms. And this is a really a nice example of a collaboration between Future Forests and Urban Futures. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Um, before we get started officially, I wanted to just have a few reminders to, I guess we can control your microphones, but just in case you don't um, uh, do that. And then we will also be filming the presentation as part of this meeting, um, not the questions from the audience. So if you do not want to be on the film, then you need to turn your cam cameras off. Um, and then uh, I think we'll be saving the questions for the end. Marcus and Karen and Johanna will have kind of a discussion um, and then we're, we're um, I believe we'll open it up for uh, questions after about a half an hour. Um, but without further ado, I will leave it. I will stop sharing my screen and um, if I can manage that. Oh, I guess. Yeah, that's it for now. Yeah, so then uh, I guess we will take over. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I thought that maybe uh, yeah, I can start presenting myself. I'm Johanna Lundström and I'm, as you said, a, a researcher in forest planning and working a lot with uh, biodiversity issues connected to, to forest and forestry. Uh, and I will lead this discussion, but I will uh, mostly leave the word to Karin and Marcus. So I thought that maybe you would wanted to start to, uh, by presenting yourself and, and maybe give a short uh, background in what you're doing and, and what your angles are um, connected to planning of urban forestry. Yeah, Colin, <laughs> would you like to start? Yes, I have my microphone on, good. Uh, I, um, I am Colin Fellman-Lilquist and I am um, Head of Sustainability at Skogselskapet and uh, as, and, and I will represent the practitioners today. Um, Skogselskapet is, as some of you might know, a foundation, and we we allocate our our a lot of of, of our fundings to uh, to research around uh, forestry and nature conservation. Uh, but we are also a manager of of our own forest, and we manage other people's forest and where we are specialized in um, municipality forests. So we, ha we are the, the biggest manager of municipality forests. So that is why, I guess that is why I was invited to this event. Um, but I also have a background from, from Svea School where I used to work a lot with forest certification and mainly FSC, where this is a very important part too to Man to have uh, what to say to interact with people who are in the forest 
when you are performing a certified forestry, forest management. And I was also part of making the guidelines for the plan, planners at Svea Skog how to make the recreational, how to, how to make recreational or management in recreational areas, let's say. So I have some experience from that field. Okay, so uh, thank you, Corinne. So hi everyone, I'm Marcus. I can see some familiar faces here as well. So I guess I will try to represent sort of research part and I have sort of a mixed background. So I think that is why I can sort of talk about, about urban forestry. I come from nature conservation side from the beginning with landscape ecology and doing some studies of biodiversity of birds in urban areas. Uh, I've also been working within urban planning for a short while with um, this master plan, Översheets plan for Uppsala municipality. It becomes some years ago, but I'm still referring to that experience uh, where I was sort of nature conservation and outdoor recreation strategist working with those things. But for the last maybe decade or so, I've been working with um, uh, sort of, one can say the opposite around where I've been working with uh, how, how people perceive the urban, urban forest or urban greening in these areas. So I have sort of a mixture with that. And um, I'm uh, so, and I've been working with uh, Professor uh, Peter Fredman with outdoor recreation uh, surveys, uh, national and outdoor recreation surveys, where we particularly looked into different types of uh, habitats where people were moving, for example, forests as well. And, um, and lately I'm working with projects of how do we actually sort of bring the urban forest into our offices to some extent. So I'm really trying to build uh, uh, literate, literature, uh, uh, directly trying to build a forest indoor in Helsingborg city, for example, indoor housing, including smell and sight and things. And uh, I can also say that I'm, I'm part of this uh, forest and health uh, at SLU, uh, where we are spread out in Sweden. So there's a group working with forest and health. And I'm also uh, uh, involved in this urban futures as a hub coordinator here in, in Uppsala. So I'm trying to sort of link things and discuss with Karin back and forth the sort of my experience, but also the research linked to urban forestry and perhaps biodiversity and health, <laughs> I hope. Good, so I will, I will give you a first question then. Uh, what would you say characterize the planning of urban forest and, and what makes this planning different from ordinary forest planning in more rural areas? Hmm. Do you want me to start, Marcus? Yeah, please. <laughs> um, yeah, when, when you talk about, uh, I mean, it's a little bit, the, the urban forestry could be so many things and it's a little bit where do you draw the line to, to the urban, urbanness? And when, when you are inside forestry or in the forestry sector, we talk a lot about uh, the use of the forest, who uses the forest and for what do they use it? And, um, and there is a work that was done with, um, with the National Board of Forestry where they made this um, part of the um, Mål builder för god miljöhänsyn. That is a big um, collaboration between the forest in the forestry sector with the National Board of Forestry. That was the that was the host of that project, and part of that was recreational forestry, and that that was one thing that really helped when when we were setting the the guides for to, for doing this to actually. Um, have the discussion about what is a, what is an urban forest and what is um, wh what do people use the forest for and um, yeah that was a huge work and, and it's it's um, and there are a lot of um, what to say guidelines I, I wouldn't say that it's it's a, a guide how to do it it's more about a toolbox. Because when it comes to when it comes to managing forest for humans, as in urban forestry, uh, then you you it's very hard because everyone thinks different things. So 
but in the same time, it quite, it's quite easy because you can ask them what they, what they like. It's harder to, uh, to ask a lichen or a, a mushroom what, they, what kind of forest they like. So I would say, if I, if I would use one word, I would use um, uh, the word that I can't <laughs> find in English right now, <laughs> but collaboration and discussion, engagement, that is the word I'm looking for. Engagement, that is the, the most important thing when it comes to managing the, the really, the urban forests. And, and it's also, it puts a little bit of light on what forest, what, what is the responsibility for the forest owners? Because you have to remember that all the forest that we have in Sweden is owned by someone. And even if the owner is a, it, it's different if, if the owner is a municipality or the different is a, or, or the owner is a private forest owner or a big forest company, they have different, uh, at least, According, yeah, they have different they have different um, um, responsibilities, mainly from themselves that they are setting their own rules. But if you're certified, you have one set of rules that you need to follow. If you are certified according to FSC, and and if you're a municipality, they all, all mostly have the have different um, guidelines for how they use their forest. So they. Uh, and, and one of them are very often to, to provide the inhabitants in the, in the municipality with some kind of recreational forest or something like that. So it's, um, it is different, but you have to go, and the most important thing as with all forestry planning is to go back to the, the goals of the owners. And, and when it comes to, to urban forests, I would say to, to see how the forests are used by whom and to have engagement with those people. That is the short answer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but that was really good. I mean, I have, you, you raised some things here, which I sort of come to, which is really interesting that you put it real nicely that there is a lot of engagement. Uh, I mean, I, you can also say it's a lot of opinions about this is my forest and so on and i think this is also which you emphasize here as sort of an ongoing question which links to where is the limit or what is an urban forest because there is to some extent uh, i know Uppsala municipality worked for some years ago where you sort of objectively define in gis what a forest is but then when you actually ask people on the street, what do they consider being an urban forest? That could be something really different. That could be a really minor, uh, just some few trees nearby where kids are playing. Mm -hmm. So it's also about, it comes back to, I mean, there is no real definition of what a forest is, but there is a discussion of the size of a forest, for example, that could be really different in urban areas to what people consider being it somewhere else. And that goes, of course, then for the most difficult parts, then when you have the border of the city and from how, where you talk about something like called peri-urban forest, uh, which sort of is also linked to where, where is this sort of an urban forest and when does it become traditional forestry as for production and so on, and also about land ownership. So there are so many levels in this, but I would say that sort of, uh, for example, a lot of new, um, uh, let's go back some steps then. But it's sort of linked to multifunctionality. There is a lot of opinions about forestry, I would say. And most of it is, as you said, I would say also linked to uh, human and people's perception and not really to maybe biodiversity. So there's been a lot of emphasis of ecosystem services linked to forestry. Uh, and then coming back to, uh, to this, where is this peri-urban forest? Because uh, and this you can help me with, Corinne, about the land ownership somewhere, because it's like what I read in literature, it's been that municipalities long time ago bought up a lot of land for future expansions. And then these expansions didn't go as fast as they were expected. Or in Stockholm, they did to some, to some extent, because Stockholm City sold their parts to other municipalities. But that sort of left a lot of untouched uh, forest nearby urban areas for not being, uh, since they were owned by the municipality and sort of awaits 
some kind of expansion from the city, but then becoming having higher natural values or higher biodiversity values than the average forest further out. And this sort of creates a sort of a non-defined area from the city border out to areas where you where you have more this production landscape, where it's a sort of a yeah, municipality owned area. Yeah. And, and I would say that that when it comes to the the ownership of municipality, there are I mean, I think we have around 200 and something municipalities in Sweden. And I would say that it's a huge difference in how much forest they have, if they have forest, and what the goals with the forest are, what they use as the forest for and the reasons why they have forest and etc. So they are, I mean, it, it's um, when, when you dig into this, it's really, it's hard to find a red line in this because it's very different. Yeah, I know from Uppsala, for example, we have Uppsala University, our landowners, SLU, do own some forestry, the, the municipality, private owners, the church, and all of these, I think, are landowners, even within the same nature reserve just outside Uppsala, at least most of these. So it's, I can understand that this is really, really complicating. Yeah, and, and when it comes to this time perspective in, in the planning process, but because when we, when we plan, forest we want to have a long time span because forest grows slowly and, and when we want when we, when we plan it we, we need to consider it over a long long time but but the municipalities maybe they are they have a shorter uh, planning uh, period in do you want to say something about that no but uh, yeah I, I can say something about that because that is something when when you are a manager for for municipalities uh, you realize that they are working on a four-year schedule mostly because they are political elections. Uh, maybe not always with the force. They, they have hopefully, in, in the best of cases, they have a forest strategy and they are working with a, with a long-time strategy. But it could also change from one um, uh, election period to another. And that is something that you have to have in mind when you are managing the, the forest of of municipalities. And, and right now it's very, I would say that it's um, very popular that to have by the politicians in municipalities to, to for example, work with um, continuous forest, continuous cover forests, which is a little bit hard when it, when it has, when as a manager, you need to know what the goal is. Why do you want continuous, continuous cover? And it's hard for the politicians to answer that. And we don't really know what happened. And that is also a very long time frame to reset the forest for, for that kind of forestry. And, and some, some, some of them, for, for some municipalities and some sides, it's very important to, to that the, the forest should uh, create a lot of money. And then, then you have to have the production idea in your planning too. So there is a huge difference between between the, the different goals and strategies between and the and the knowledge and interests also in musical. And uh, sorry, <laughs> I think I think this is really interesting because it's sort of if you look over time and if you uh, if if someone actually uh, I mean the general trend is still that there's been sort of a planning a way of planning where actually it's been highlighting the need of densifying cities with arguments if you look into the larger perspective so it's actually been a reduction of forests in cities over time and this is not just only in sweden it's like a global pattern of densifying cities at the same time as they're spreading and this is also highlighted in the ipbes report the one linking to biodiversity where it's sort of emphasizing somewhat that the, the need, it's not particularly urban forest, but sort of urban green, that there is an increasing interest by cities to sort of highlight the importance of green. And you can see a slight trend that greenery is increasing, but not at the same amount as it's been expecting if you want to keep sort of ecosystem services, etc., on, on a higher level. 
And then it sort of says that cities don't know, or I, I was trying to find the formula here for, but it sort of says something like cities don't know how to plan and incorporate nature in cities for biodiversity. So it's sort of a, a, a dual trend here, sort of, that you're highlighting the importance of this. And, and as Karin said, I mean, you have this short perspective in cities, which Karin knows uh, more about when she's working with this hands-on, I think, but it's also like they are planning often 20 or 30 years ahead in municipal planning, right, for this Översheeks planering. And they often sort of plan for, for big areas. And I know that it's actually uh, com the nature reserves in cities. I was reading this in Sora Boristrom's thesis at Stockholm Resilience Center, that nature reserves in, in, in urban areas are often bigger than they are in, um, in rural areas. So they actually save them in a bigger areas. So, uh, so it's sort of this sort of spatial perspective into this. But in the end, in the end, um, uh, it's a big variation between the cities. As Colin said, there is no pattern in this. Uh, the size of of urban woods within the cities is not linked to the number of people in the city. So you can have really big cities with. Uh, with very little forestry in Sweden, Malmö, for example, and then you have Stockholm, who has like on average twenty percent forest within the city. So it's really, it's not linked to the size of the city. So there is politics politics within this, or an idea of this long term perspective. Yeah, maybe we can take this question then. When you when you mention Malmö here, uh, uh, if have, have you read it, Marcus? No, no, no. no. If it's the if it's the what what do they look at? Do they look at the quality of the recreation forest, or is it green areas, or is it just uh, uh, the size, or that they are close to people? Oh, but this is really interesting. I mean, there are some things that are really important, seemingly when you come when it comes to forest in particular, because it's sort of like there are three things you're needing for for health benefits or. Uh, uh, or greenery when people preserve this, it's sort of the size of the green, but also how accessible they are. It's it's like uh, often it's sort of counted that you have certain meters to to the nearest uh, uh, to the nearest urban green, which is often misused, I would say, because they often just draw a line from where people are living to the nearest forest, but not really counting that it might be a railroad or there might be a lake or there might be an area which you which which you feel unsafe within but also then when it comes to to quality uh but uh, the question is if uh, um if if quality is uh, is considered or if it's just a size yeah uh i i don't know from from that that study in particular but i know that this is a sort of a way of the that uh, that they're, they're trying to have these kind of indicators uh, in your in, in Sweden and in Europe. For example, the Swedish environmental uh, objectives or the generation goal, they have a goal saying that people where they live should have a nature reserve within one kilometer where you live. At, e, at EU level, they're trying to have 300 meters to an area of one hectare without defining the quality. And then there's been recently a highlighting from uh, Cecil, Cecil Queen and Jake van den Bosch, uh, which is a professor in urban uh, forestry. And anyone who is Dutch here could sort of blame you for the pronunciation, but he sort of says that uh, during the pandemic, for example, it seems that people would like to have, he, he drives something called like 330, 300, that you would have three trees from the window of your own that you can see from your own windows and then um, uh, 30 oh, what is it what does it mean by 30 then because i'm sort of confused here now <laughs> so it's sort of and then um, 300 meters to at least uh, a forest with some qualities so it's also highlighting this with forest in particular so, and, and then when it comes to quality, for example, it's really important then because this, this question is good then because when we were asking 1,300 people in Gothenburg about uh, the perception of urban areas, and we compared, for example, with parks and with what we call urban remnants or urban forests 
it was clear that these urban woodlands or these more natural areas were perceived more aesthetically positive and an area where people actually wanted to be visiting more. So there is really important to sort of define these qualities. Ah, oh, 33 is from your house, 30% cover of trees in neighborhood and 300 meters to the nearest green area. So that is what they're trying to emphasize. Uh, and, and when it comes to urban forest planning, what, what values do we, do we look at? We, we had touched upon it a bit, but it's uh, uh, what does the research and, and the experience say about this? What, what do we know and what do we, what do we not know yet about different values of, of urban forest for the people? Yeah, I, I can only talk from experience and, and, and what, and, and I think that it differs, of course, and, and I think that in, um, in many cases when it comes to, I mean, when it comes to what, what people like to be involved, because I'm talking a lot of in, involvement and engagement, and I think that the most important thing and, and now I'm not talking from a research perspective, just from, from experience and from my, my colleagues tells me, it is the feeling of being involved, of involvement, that, that someone actually asked me, what, what do I want in, in, the, in, the, in the 30, 30 forests, 33 forests uh, outside my window, what, that, that I will, that I will, feel like they, they asked me for that. That is one of the most important things I would say from, from a, a, a practical perspective. And um, I think that there is also a very big uh, emphasis on variation. It's not so, I mean, you could actually have, uh, we see from a lot of examples where, where it's, it's not the forestry per se that is the problem, it, it, if you do a clear cut on, on, a, on a very big area, that's a problem. But if you do many small clear cuts, it could even make a good perception because it's, it's, it's lighter and it's better. So, so it's, um, it's a variety, let's say, the variety is a very good thing when it comes to, and to, to have that in mind when you plan urban forestry. And uh, yeah. Maybe you have something more there, Marcus. From <laughs> this was only my thoughts and <laughs> my. Maybe, maybe you can tell me the truth now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean there is there is no truth, but there are new new and new more findings where you can sort of tune in on these links to sort of what what do you mean by or how to manage an urban forest for increased health? I mean we talked about the big issues as you need to access it, you need to be able to go there, or uh, I think one. One major, one major thing that hasn't really been found is like how much dose response do you need? How often do you need to be there in the forest to actually have this nice part? But for example, uh, what we saw with Peter Fredman was that uh, when we showed pictures on different types of forests, uh, the, the forest that people actually preferred the most to go and have outdoor recreation is, is then uh, sort of old growth deciduous forests. And if you look into Sweden, that is the least we have. That is something that is rather unique for cities. And, and I would say that actually small forest in, in, one, uh, survey, in one study actually showed that you have sort of a bit more deciduous trees in urban areas. So the most preferred forest is the one we have the least if it comes to outdoor recreation, really. Uh, uh, this was done with eight and a half thousand people, but of course there is a bias towards Southern Sweden then. But then again, this uh, natural, that it's also something linked to that nature is something that people preserve versus these um, more formalized areas. And this, I would say, is a management issue in cities as well, because people want safety and these semi-open areas and security. So there is a parkification, I call it, within urban forestry, where you sort of you fix trees from falling branches, uh, you you need to sometimes cut the grass just nearby so you cut some branches where kids can't can't go and play and so on and and if you 
go even further deeper into this. I mean, we often talk about management or, or people's perception or health benefits that are often linked to what we see. But then, of course, we, are, we as humans perceive our, our surroundings with all different senses. So we actually looked into a study which links to biodiversity, which we haven't really been speaking about here, but also that, that uh, when you just added the sound of um, house sparrow, which is more like a chat, then you people perceived the pictures of number four as much more positive. And then you could go in the deeper into it that we perceive with all our sound systems. So I made a study for sort of what people link to stress reduction. And you can see a really fast stress reduction for people coming into an artificial urban environment in virtual reality. With just a few minutes, you, you reduce your physiological stress. Uh, but then it seemed like the most important part for reducing your stress was actually smell. And often when you talk about urban areas and management or when people talk about the urban forest, maybe they, they often don't talk about sound sound or uh, or the smell of the forest. But so it's really, uh, and it's also linked to more um, uh, environmental psychology factors that people have stronger links to urban forests when you ask them compared to parks. So if they say, I, I, uh, I have a memory of this place or something like that, it's stronger for urban forests. But that is really linked to sort of these nuances towards this. I know you have done some interesting studies also when it comes to, to gender and, and how they perceive uh, uh, these uh, values. Do you want to say something about that? Yeah, it's uh, it's me then and uh, also design and we, we did some ecosystem services and linking to questions about urban urban forest and we could see that it was it's especially our environmental uh, professor environmental psychology saw that there were really big differences they haven't seen those big differences between genders and the way perceived uh, or used nature. Uh, in this case, we first just ask a question about urban green and. There was so big difference. So it was significant. Women did rest or hang out with friends, enjoy the nature, walked, got fresh air, looked for shadow, follow the seasons, study animals, all questions. Women did more than men. And in a Finnish study, they also saw that women felt that they were more uh, stress released or had uh, more rapid stress reduction than men. Uh, women also considering that forests should be more preserved than men. And we can also see recently in studies when we follow patterns of people using urban forestry and urban parks, that there are actually different patterns in how men and women use this. And this is something maybe you haven't, that is not included within management of urban forests to sort of elaborate on how do you, how do you make this comfortable or the way different people are using this, uh, these forests. Um, uh, we actually spoke a bit about uh, just talking about gender issues in this. Um, there is a book from the S faculty that you can have free to download in Swedish, where we sort of elaborate a bit more about this, who has the power of the forests in the city and how it links to sort of gender aspects. I see that the, the I time... I be a bit short. <laughs> yeah, uh, we are... We are... We, are, we have talked for half an hour now, so, so maybe we can, if someone has any questions, someone in the audience, uh, we could take them now. Otherwise, I, I think we can continue discussing also, but, but if someone has a question, that would be fun. I, I can comment on what uh, Harald um, mentioned there, that Boverket has looked into methods of measuring tree canopy coverage, for example, about how much forest there is. So, I mean, uh, there is a sort of a trend of using really uh, aerial photos or infrared uh, uh, spatial spatial gear to sort of map forest and and in air in in urban areas. And recently, there is this tool that is free to download now. It's called iTree, where you can actually map trees all over cities. But uh, but also then to mention this that we. There are very few monitoring programs that really looked into other biodiversity cities, which you can't see from monitoring. Mostly what we've been talking about, Karin and I here, like the linkages to how people perceive, but also other species in cities, because you have sort of 
monitoring of birds or uh, you have national monitoring of butterflies and you have um, in the Swedish mountain areas and even the Swedish forestry inventories, they don't particularly look into details in urban areas. And this is something that I would say is lacking. So you can sort of see the patterns and the canopy covers and even the tree species. But I would say sort of that biodiversity in cities is um, there is a lack of regular inventories. And the reason for that, I would say, is that there is no, that we have a strong self-independent municipalities in Sweden. Uh, that uh, the different agencies, they have other areas of interest and the municipalities are sort of... Uh, big municipalities can do that because they have the effort, but we can't compare of whole of Sweden. Yeah. Yeah, and no, we, talk, we have we have no no one raises any hands. What I can see, uh, we talk about biodiversity. Um, is why why is that not dealt with? Is that is that because they are not? Uh, it's not mentioned in their strategies, or it's a lack of knowledge from within the municipalities, or why? Because when it comes to to forest planning. In general, I, I have the impression that after the, the financial or the more timber values, it's biodiversity that, that are included in, in the planning process. So, so why is why is this? Yeah, uh, I, I can, as I said, I'm, I'm not a researcher in this, but uh, but I think that there is, I think there is something in that, and and I I don't think that even when it comes to municipality forest, it's very rare that the economics comes first. So I would say that it's it's much about health and recreational habits, etc. That's the first thing. When you both when you ask citizens and and when you ask politicians, etc. And and I would we made this um, survey, just a, a small non scientific survey. But we asked um, politicians and uh, and um, people working for the municipalities, and I would I, I don't really remember on on what what place um, uh, this came, but it was a little bit down in the list because it was was very much about recreation and and health etc. And then then came biodiversity. And as far down in the list as you could come was climate, which was a little bit interesting for us because climate is such a big thing when you talk about when you talk about forestry in general. But that was nothing that the the, muni the politicians in the muni municipalities. I, I don't even know that someone took had the climate on a very high place. So it was it was a little bit strange for us that. So I think that you they you see the forest the the reasons to to manage the forest very different if it's if it's a forest that are that you have the impression that it should be recreational forest. Uh, yeah, but but ad additional to that, I would say that biodiversity is important though for the specific cities or when you're trying to uh, explore exploit a place. Because the first thing that happened is that there is an inventory done to some extent, but this also varies depending on the uh, economic strength of the municipality and the ones who's going to build there and so on. So, I mean, some area, some cities really have uh, really, really good inventories because it always comes to an issue, at least in, in uh, sort of semi big or bigger cities when you want to do something you always do some kind of biodiversity inventories but what i'm what i'm trying to say here is it's not systematic it's sort of a way of like we're going to build here okay let's go and do some inventories and it's already sort of part of the plan because you need to build a house there and you find something and it could be for example in um, this uh, northern crested newt stor vattensalamander 
we, or some bats that are on different lists uh, for EU EU habitats that you're not allowed to move or change their their habitats or provide them with good habitats that really hinders uh, urban planning to some extent if you find these species. But then it sort of becomes strange because other species, although you find 200 year old pine trees with red listed species, they will be they will be taken down due to the need of housing. So it's really, I would say biodiversity is there, but it's not that, uh, and it's also sort of highlighted in, um, I don't know, maybe uh, fuzzy policies sort of linked to that. We will try, we will keep the biodiversity in this municipality. Uh, but when it comes to practice, it's really difficult. But it's also, I think that it's also a, a matter of when it comes to the, the idea of uh, nature reserves, for example, in, in Swedish forestry, that it, I, I actually, I, I have to admit that I'm a little bit ignorant about this at the moment because I don't know if it has changed. But some years ago, at least, you had to have, have nature biodiversity values to, to make uh, a protected forest, a certain amount of biodiversity values. You couldn't say that it should be a protected forest just for social values or recreational values. So I think it, it, it's also, when, when you look at it uh, from, from that perspective, uh, it has helped to have, to have a good biodiversity too, to, to actually, it, and, and, and I mean, it, it shows a little bit about what we what we value the most, and if if it's strong, you have a stronger case if you have if you have biodiversity values too. You see what I mean, Marcus? I don't know yeah, if, yeah. No, I agree. if I think yeah. that's a, if yeah. I have a point here. Yeah, yeah, no. So it's uh, yeah, and it's that that's what's make this sort of um, yeah a tricky <laughs> tricky way of planning, I would say. But, but I also want to highlight this with uh, there, there is increasing discussion about uh, biodiversity offsets. I don't know, Corinne, if you come to that, I mean, this ecologic compensation in Swedish, where people are saying that we can sort of, we take down this part of the city. It's, it's mostly wet, wet areas and so maybe not so often forest, but you take down some forestry and then you try to either increase the values in another forest somewhere else or you, 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 you make nature serve in another forest. Yeah, and, and, and that is, I, I think that is still quite new in Sweden. I have never heard of it in a, in a city perspective. I know that there are some cases when it comes to mining up north in, in uh, Gällivare, Malmberg, et cetera, where they have actually done that uh, and, and make, made some nature values in other forests, etc. But I think that we will see more about this. I mean, if, if I if I should make a, just a, I, I think that, that, that we will see that, but I don't, we, uh, for my, I see that, I think that we lack a lot of business models when it comes to ecological compensation right now. And that is the, the, this our, our biggest obstacle for that, that we don't really know how to how to make that. And I think that could definitely be some some something that we could use in, in urban forests too, but we're not there yet. No, uh, I think you're, you're, you're right about that because uh, there's been a, a rather recent project linked to this and uh, the reports are really just recently coming out and it is what you say that, this is something, this is an initiative that uh, municipalities would like to do. I know, I know they're talking about that because this is an area south of Uppsala here, or actually part of Uppsala, where they're going to build 21,000 housing units. And they say, we would like to do some kind of ecological compensation because that would be in a forest somehow, but they don't know how to do that. And there is no, no good answer because the basic idea is a no net loss. But if you actually build on a forest and then you compensate on another place, there would not be a no net loss. And then, of course, forest is more tricky than other areas because can you actually sort of, uh, 
I don't know, you have 150 year old trees and then you have to save uh, a ground somewhere else to allow 150 year old trees to grow there or at least allow them to be that old in another place. So th this is sort of a way of, um, yeah. And I think there is a, there's a mixture here where there is initiative taken. I know in Örebro, for example, they, they were in a forest where there was a factory that was to be built. And it was like, if it's not built in Örebro, Västerås will take it. And then uh, they decided to have it in Örebro. And then they sort of cut down some old trees and move them to another place and provided that as a nature reserve and say, we've done some compensation. But then again, the old forest was gone. Yeah, but this is maybe another, I just thought it was interesting to mention this because I too think this will be a sort of a, a future maybe linked to forest ownership as well that forest owners can say well i will use my forest as a as a set off for this you can you can buy some ecological compensation yeah. in my yeah. forest yeah yeah do we have uh, uh, do we need to stop recording before we we take the questions or do we do we have any questions well, there, there are some in the in the chat here. Can ah, see. can you see, is, is there? Oh, there are more. Okay. Mm, someone is to, asking about the Millennium Forest in Malmö, but maybe I need to get that explained for me. I, I have no, I don't know anything about that. But do, do, they, do the people who have asked those questions, maybe they can take them in person? Hi, I have a question. I'd be happy to yeah. um, elaborate. So I, I'm a master's student here and I just moved to Malmo and I came across this uh, forest in the southern part of the city that sort of took me by surprise. Um, I have a background in urban forestry and it's primarily all exotic species planted very densely. Many of them are Metasequoia glyptostriboides, which is kind of an ancient tree. Um, and it's, it's a huge space. So, and I guess it's for the future of a botanical garden in Malmo. And I, I was just a little surprised that Malmo had chosen to plant the entire space with almost exotic species. I mean, I know it's a botanical garden, but um, I don't know, it just raised a lot of questions about climate change and trees and adaptation. And I was wondering what your thoughts are about that. And it's a really great space. If you guys haven't been there, I'd recommend checking it out. I was in Malmö last Friday, but I missed that. <laughs> but I, I, can, I can only briefly say that there is a discussion. I mean, when you come to sort of, I mean, I guess this is in the forestry as well, Corin can say that, but I know, for example, when you go really into urban planning in Sweden, there's, there is a discussion saying that this climate change will come pretty fast and, we, and they are elaborating with that uh, urban trees will not copy with that. So how do, we, how do we find other species? So there is an ongoing discussion of having exotic species that are more like cities in Hungary these days to sort of uh, be able to survive in the coming 50 years, but it's both ways. I mean, uh, and this is sort of nature conservation versus urban design and uh, aesthetics. And, and I would say when it comes to, when it comes to forestry, uh, it's that uh, um, we are, and we as yes, to say that the, the Swedish forest owners, etc and the National Board of Forestry are very restrictive when it comes to, to exotic species, none the least the certification, but also, I mean, it's, we, we are working mostly with, um, with um, species that are natural from, from this area. And, and there is an ongoing discussion about climate change too, but uh, I would say that it's too much of a risk to, to have, uh, exotic species in the forest, and at least that's the general perception. Thank you. And then it was this question about, uh, oh, it was also from you, what this, uh, 
LIDAR DATA MAPPING. Uh, can, you, can you read the question? I don't see that maybe, I don't know. Uh, uh, if, if Swedish municipalities use tree canopy assessment using LIDAR data and mapping uh, to quantify their canopy and whether it's growing or declining. Um, I don't know. And uh, I actually, I, I don't know because I think it's, um, and I'm, I'm now I'm thinking of from statistics, forestry statistics, if there even is a, a munis, municipality forest um, column, so to speak. And, and I don't think there is. So I think it's, it, it, it's up to, it's up to each municipality how they, how they use this, what data they use and how they, they monitor their forest. And of course there are, I guess, I have no idea, but I guess that there are municipality forests in Big Skogs Taxeringen too, but they are not categorized as municipality forests. Yeah, I, I can only agree with Corin. I think, and it's also that some, some municipalities, I know Gothenburg and Malmö and the biggest cities, they buy leader data, really high resolution data for all types of purposes. Uh, not specifically then, and, and it depends on really if you want to do this mapping, because I will elaborate with the leader data in Gothenburg, for example, and that was sort of taken for other purposes than mapping green. So it wasn't really good. It had some vague resolution in the middle of where there were a lot of green areas, for example, that were not possible to use that. But I think um, bigger cities as Gothenburg, Malmö and Stockholm, they are using LIDAR and, and DVA to sort of map trees and see the canopy covers. But uh, then again, it comes to back to what I've said previously, that that might be, it could have been a sort of a national coordinator just looking to this data and see what is the cover. But I would say this is, this is uh, occasionally done by the Swedish statistics. So they are doing some kind of this greenery mapping but they are doing it in a sort of uh, non-systematic way. It's like when it's asked by the agencies, they do that. So they did a sort of major inventory maybe 15, 10, 15 years ago. And then they changed the method these days to more lead our data. And then it's not comparable about how, how much has the forest, the forest cover changed since 2010. Then it's sort of a new baseline with lead our the last few years. So there is, there are some more things to do this to sort of see what do we, what kind of data do we got and how do we see this in a bigger spatial pattern in Sweden? Okay, thanks. Um, the question was also for me, and uh, it seems like in the U.S. there's a lot of cities who are using this as sort of their standard and went through the awkward transition from using aerial imagery and switching to uh, lidar. And you know, not having comparable data, but now, as more years have passed, it's much more accurate, um, and it's used heavily in urban forestry. So I was curious if that was something that's happening here as well. Yeah, I think this eye tree thing <laughs> uh, that you sort of map trees in Sweden—that is, uh, it's really new here. It just came last year. But it's been, as far as I know, really highlighted in the US and, and Canada, I think. So that is, Sweden is the only one in Europe using that at the moment. Uh, and then we also get a question connected to ecological compensation. And uh, maybe we, we touched upon that, but uh, uh, if uh, the question is if it is compensation or compromise according to the value disappearing yeah that is that is sort of the the key question i would <laughs> yeah. say no no it's it's not really a it's more like a compromise to some extent i would say that is like it's very difficult to get the really true no net loss i sort of have a follow-up to that um but is there is there legislation or policy that that requires any kind of compensation. I mean, from a bio, as far as I understand, there isn't unless there's some kind of red listed species, but from a kind of biodiversity perspective or 
I mean, so this is just a voluntary make us feel better for putting 20,000 houses on a, or <laughs> units on something or, or yeah, I guess I'm kind of curious what the driver is or, or if it will actually be a widespread thing if there's not a policy behind it. I, I don't know, but what I can say I, when it comes to this mining, uh, uh, the mining areas in, in Northern Sweden, but then it was um, in the in the what do you call it <laughs> the tillstånd uh, the, the permit the, the permit it mm -hmm. was said that they needed to make some ecological compensation so so there is uh, I know that Landstyrelsen could have that as a as a, one thing that should be done mm -hmm. to get a permit but I don't know if the, if it's the same thing when it comes to our to, to cities. No, but you, you're right. I mean, there is an ongoing, an ongoing debate on this. So it's a really good question because there are sort of recommendation of, uh, and some agencies are using this. Trafikverket, the road administration, they're using this uh, on a really big scale when they're doing things as the last sort of precaution to things. Could we do it some, could the road be somewhere else? Could we safeguard this by doing a specific thing? And the last thing is that if you can't do this, we do compensation, but it's not within any law enforcement. So this is something that municipalities and agencies are doing in a sort of, um, yeah, a more random way than it is by law enforcement. So, but there is an ongoing discussion high at the departments and agencies about how to do this. and. And uh, the recent research project and about this sort of also question about what is the, it could also be the opposite around that you say that we, we can explore whatever because we just compensate for that and pay for that. So it could be, it could be misused to some, to some extent if it's, if it's not really providing any good feedbacks. So there is a, there is a need to sort of really discuss how this is working in reality. We have, we have a final question here that I think is really interesting also. Uh, if urban forest planning is taking into account environmental justice issues, uh, for example, closeness to nature might not be the same depending on the type of neighborhood. Would you like to say something about that? I mean, as far as I understand, I mean, this is really, uh, if you just go on Google Earth, you can see that uh, lower socioeconomic areas, for example, have lower greens anywhere on earth. Uh, so there is, uh, I don't know if this is linked to environmental just this question, but it's really linked to that. Uh, uh, but there hasn't been that many studies in, in Sweden, for example, that um, because we have some lower social income areas that are very in the sort of city fringe lo located in sort of or typical urban forested areas. Uh, but I would say that this is an issue that will become, yeah, that should be more investigated in Sweden, I think, we, we, which is linked to this. But it, it's really, and it's also linked to sort of the gradient to urban city centers. We put a lot of emphasis uh, in budgeting how to provide a forest, uh, which is also linked to higher socio socioeconomic areas in the in the inner part of the cities than there are in the outskirts of the cities where the budget is lower. So it's sort of managed differently. I'm not really sure if, if this was uh, uh, a link to that. Okay, there's a thumb up there. <laughs> it's a really interesting topic, really. And it's a need for discussing this. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I'm listening with very much curiosity here because I, I have never thought about it that way, but I think it's, it's something that we need to elaborate more around, but it's not really me as a forester who should say that it's more up to the municipality and yeah. Yeah, and, and this is not only linked to, I mean, I mean, what do we mean by justice issues? For example, I was talking about uh, these gender issues, but it's also about, uh, uh, we, could, we, we saw the difference between older people above 55, that they have different movement patterns and different perception of this. And then of course you, you can see that children 
uh, are some of the ones that in need of forest or, or, or understanding of forest nearby where they live. And that is also a justice sort of, of not only, not only socioeconomic, but age is really important here, I think as well. Well, this has been a really interesting discussion. And um, I think I have to thank Johanna and Marcus and Karin for, for doing a great job steering us through this, um, a lot of uncharted waters, um, but super interesting questions um, about, yeah, urban forests. Um, I think, unless there's any more questions, um, I think I'll do a last minute uh, plug for our next uh, um, meeting. Uh, where we have uh, um, a speaker from the US, um, uh, Alec Foster, who's going to be talking about volunteer geographic information, urban forests, and environmental justice on the 11th, 17th of November. Um, so I will thank you all again for coming and asking great questions and participating. This was a really, really cool discussion.